Our New Testament reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. 14 through 21. So give attention to God's, the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness in God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly that all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this, your day again, and we thank you for this, your word. We pray now, Lord, that our our minds and our hearts would be open to the wondrous things contained in your law and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock, our strength, our redeemer, in whom we trust. In Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. When we were together, uh, Last time, we looked at the first part of this chapter, and we talked about, uh, once again, the, the mystery uh, that was revealed of God now taking this one nation, the Jews, uh, and not just having the gospel or the, the, the word go to them, but now God's grace is being made known to all, Jew and Gentile alike. And we saw how the grace of God was being made known and the, the manifold riches of God, the wisdom of God. But we also noted that at the beginning of the chapter, Paul seemed like he was going somewhere, uh, like to prayer, and he kind of takes this... Um, diversion, this detour to talk about this, this great mystery again. And now in verse 14, he's going to pick up where he left off with this wonderful uh, prayer. And we're going to look at this prayer under three headings this morning. The first is for this reason. The second is filled with all fullness. And the third is far more abundantly. So let's begin with verse 14 where Paul says, it begins with, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Well, what is this reason? Obviously, he is referring to back to what he just said. The grace of God in Jesus Christ to both Jew and Gentile. The mystery of the ages being revealed. These are the reasons that Paul gives. These, these wonderful, great reasons that the gospel is now going out to the entire world and the Ephesians are part of that and so with that in mind that the gospel is going out everywhere Paul prays this prayer this full prayer I'm going to call it for the church at Ephesus but this prayer keep in mind should serve as a model for us so keep that in mind as we go through this prayer. Paul says here, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now this is an opportunity for us to stop and to just talk for a moment about the idea of posture in prayer. Why is Paul saying he bows the knee? Is, is bowing the knee the only prescribed method of prayer or posture in prayer in scripture? Well, certainly not. But what does a bowed knee or bowed knees demonstrate? 
about me demonstrates reverence and submission. While the scripture does not prescribe one posture of prayer over another, our posture in prayer does say something about how we approach God and about our understanding of the God that we approach. If our if we're far too relaxed in our prayers, we're, we're probably not addressing God with the proper reverence that we ought to. Now, again, I'm not seeing that there's a specific posture for prayer. As a matter of fact, we see people in the scriptures kneeling. We see them standing. We see them laying uh, prostate. Prostate, not prostrate. Or prostrate, not prostate, sorry. Prostrate, not prostate. Um, see, I tried to make sure I got it right and I flipped it in my mind anyway. Uh, prostrate is when you lay flat. Prostate is something you get examined. Um, so there are various postures. Various postures. I can't remember of a single one where they're sitting, but there might be one. So what is more important is that what is our spiritual posture during our time of prayer? Our physical posture helps to reflect and maintain that spiritual posture before God. A posture of being a bowing, of showing reverence of respect, of acknowledgement that God is holy and sovereign, and we are not. We can use the position of our bodies to demonstrate that, but the real purpose is the heart. The heart. How is our heart positioned, if I can use it that way, postured before a holy God. I think that's important for us to consider. Now in verse 15 he says, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now depending on what translation you are reading from, uh, this will read slightly different. And the problem has to do with the meaning of one word in the Greek. Our ESV that I read from this morning says, from every family in heaven and on earth is named. But if we were to read from the King James or the New King James, it would say that the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what's the difference, or how do you come up with that difference? The word in Greek is a word that is designed to mean uh, be an all-encompassing term. It's a collective kind of term. It's, it can be translated, depending on the context, all, every, or the whole. Um, and I'm only bringing it up because I think that in this case, the New King James I think has a better idea of what Paul is trying to communicate when it says the whole family. Because I think Paul says the whole family here, referring back to the things he was just talking about. Every family isn't named for God, for Christ. Not every family. And it's singular. So all family doesn't even really make sense. All the families, I guess, kind of works. All the family. But it's the idea of that one body. One body. And Paul, that's what he's been talking about. One body, one family in Christ. Jew and Gentile, whether they are on earth or in heaven. There's also a bit of a wordplay that we're missing here in the Greek. The word that's translated family is a word that sounds very similar to the word for father. So they kind of come father, fatherhood, family, come together. 
That's why Paul chose that particular word there as well. But Paul is trying to draw attention again to the fact that we are all, all one in Christ. And now having established that, he is going to pray this prayer, which I'm simply calling a prayer to be filled with all fullness, because that's kind of where Paul ends up. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So he starts off, as I said, with that section with the talking about the riches and glory. Now we're going to come back to the idea of his riches and glory uh, toward the end uh, when we take up the last few verses of this section. Just keeping in mind that he's asking this according to the riches of God's glory. The first thing he asked for is that they may be strengthened with power through the Spirit in their inner being. Now we've talked much about the, the power and the indwelling and the necessity of the Holy Spirit in order for us to live Christian lives, for, in order for us to walk with Christ. So Paul is praying for the inner strength of the Ephesian church to do just that. To live in a manner that glorifies the God of heaven and earth. And we need that strength. We cannot do it on our own power. We will struggle and we will fail apart from the working of the Spirit of God in us. And Paul understands that well. And Paul communicates it in plenty of other places in his writings. That we need to be filled with the Spirit. That we need to walk in the Spirit. And so here he prays that the Ephesian church would know that power. We're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But are we all living and being strengthened in that power? The next phrase, he says, is so that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and rooted and grounded in what? Sorry. sorry, I skipped the phrase. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What do you think of when you think of the word dwell? Dwell is a very... Uh, kind of a specific word. It, it's not just live in or or live at. The idea of, of dwelling, a dwelling place is somewhere you would have it, somewhere that you you take up residence in. It's where you are, it's where you belong, it's it's your your home. It's your home. And Paul desires that they might that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith, that they might have ongoing, continuous fellowship with Christ. That wherever they go, wherever they are, Christ is with them. That sense of uninterrupted fellowship. And so that they might be thoroughly identified with the one who dwells in their hearts. Not just residing there, but welcome there, belonging there. What a, what a glorious thing to pray for the Ephesian church, that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith. That Christ might not just be part of who they are, but central to their identity, central to their person, central to their to everything about them. Now, I, I want to point out that each thing that Paul prays for is related somehow to their strength to walk in the Lord. When Christ dwells in our hearts through faith, we are strengthened to walk with Christ. We are 
reminded constantly of his presence and reminded constantly of what he has done for us, increasing daily our gratitude. The next thing that he mentions is that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. Again, this is a form of strength. Rooted and grounded in love. When you are rooted and you are grounded, we hear people use that phrase all the time. Somebody being grounded. When you're rooted and when you're grounded, you're stable. When we are rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, we are stable. We are not easily moved. The prophet Jeremiah speaks about this in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes. For its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought where it does not cease to bear fruit. Rooted, grounded in love. A tree that is rooted is also well nourished. Well nourished. Paul also speaks of being rooted in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Rooted. And built up in him, in Christ. Rooted and grounded in love. What love? The love of God. The love of Christ for us. Again, why? So that we would not be easily moved. And so that we would be well uh, nourished. Unto life. The next thing that Paul prays regarding is comprehension and, and knowledge. In verse 18 and 19 he says that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Earlier in the chapter in Ephesians 3.10 Paul talks about the manifold wisdom of God. Remember that? The, the multicolored, beautiful wisdom of God. And here it is the unfathomable, immeasurable love of Christ that we are to know. It seems like whatever character of God we talk about, whatever characteristic, whatever perfection, to use the older term, of God that we talk about, it always seems to be in plenty. It always seems to be manifold. It always seems to be incalculable, unfathomable. It reminds me of uh, Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 36, talking about the wisdom of God. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of God? Or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Um, Paul wants the Ephesian believers to have the strength to understand and know the love of God for us. I think there's an interesting tie there that he says to be able to comprehend it and to know it. I think Paul understands that we can know about something, we can comprehend something without it becoming a real knowledge. You can know something without it having any effect on you. And Paul says, I want you to know the depth of it, which is impossible to know the depth of it. So he realizes that's something we continue to pray for, to know that love of God, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. 
I want you to be able to understand it, the depths of it, and then I want you to know what I think you, Paul probably means experientially. I want you to experience it, to know it from experience. The love of Christ. To know it deeply, richly, to take it down into the deepest parts of your mind and your heart. That it might be transforming and strengthening. He finishes the prayer section by saying that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And we're done. Oh, to have that life. Oh, to have that life. A life filled with the abiding presence of Christ. Steadfastness, spiritual power, love, wisdom, and knowledge. That we can and ought to be bursting at the seams with the presence of Christ and the evidence of it. Filled with all the fullness of God. Something which is actually impossible. In the truest sense. But Paul says, I want you to continue to be filled. I want you to be filled and then filled more and filled more. I don't think Paul wants us to be content with the amount that we have. But why aren't we? I think the key reason for why we are not is that we do not ask. We do not desire. And that may be characteristic of some of the way that we pray in general. We ask for the ordinary and not the extraordinary, especially when it comes to our spiritual lives and the spiritual lives of others. We ask for maybe peace. We ask often for things that are far more about the temporal concerns of this world than we do for the spiritual concerns of the world. Or spiritual concerns of one another, the spiritual concerns of ourselves. Do we regular, regularly pray to know the presence of God in our lives? As we go into our, our, our corporate prayers and our, and our prayer meetings, we need to incorporate this kind of prayer more and more. To be praying for the spiritual strength and vitality of one another. As Paul has prayed it for the Ephesian church. But Paul asks this with this in mind. That God's grace is far more abundant. I remember he started this, this prayer section saying that according to the riches of his glory, Paul prays, understanding that God is rich. The riches of his glory, we could say the riches of his grace, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his love, the riches of his wisdom, they're all rich. So he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. That should serve as a convicting phrase for us that we so often box God in. We limit him to the problems in our lives and we don't even do a good job with limiting him to those. Do we understand that the things Paul's phrase for are the things that God wants us to have and wants us to pray for and wants us to desire as those who follow Jesus Christ, as those who are in Jesus Christ, as those who are part of that whole family that Paul mentions. We understand that God is Abundantly capable of abundance. That he is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. According to his glory and for his glory, of course. 
And then he says, according to the power at work within us. So Paul is saying that that power is available, is at work in us, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Glory in the church. The church exists to bring glory to God. Glory to God in worship. Glory to God in obedience. Glory to God in evangelism. And in everything and in all things that we do to bring glory to Him. That's the purpose of the church. That is the purpose of every congregation. And the church as a whole. And obviously to bring glory to Christ through the church. At the same time, and, and this same God equips us to bring him glory and to bring glory to Christ forever. Forever. The supply of God's grace and riches and power are endless to the point where God will never exhaust them as long as time is and even after time is God strengthens his people my question as we conclude to ask ourselves I want to focus on that one phrase where he talks about Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. Because I think if we can answer something about this question, it will all these other things will come into place. Ask yourself this hard question. Can those who come near to you tell that Christ dwells there? Can those who come near you tell that Christ dwells there? I can almost guarantee none of us will like the answer that we come up with. Because we know that we should all the more be able to tell. And we now know we have no excuse. We can ask God for the power and the strength for Christ to dwell in us in such a way that people will know that Christ dwells within us. Not just by saying that Christ dwells in us, but because our lives are characterized by Christ who dwells in us and by the power of his spirit. Those of us who find ourselves part of the whole family of God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Let's pray. Father God, everlasting Father, we thank you for this time in your word we thank you that your word encourages us and, and challenges us at the same time we thank you that it calls us to ask more boldly for the fullness of the spiritual life that we are to have in Christ Lord may me may we not be satisfied with anything else we pray this in Christ's name This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreform.com, or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out, and may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.